my Corbigale Nation, and welcome to another episode of the Micro Moment. It's me, John. Not many scientists are great or even good communicators. We tend to easily slide into technical jargon or techniques that we use every day, but most may not even know about. This is one of the reasons the Micro Moment was started, to try to bring to the public what we learn in science in an easily understandable episodes, in addition to getting people to hopefully fall in love or get a new appreciation of the microbial world. This brings me to our guest, Dr. Jake Robinson, who has written a book entitled Invisible Friends. Invisible Friends is a book that truly embodies our mission at Microbigales. It inspires, it educates, and it sheds light on all ways microbes help humanity. Jake is a microbial ecologist and an academic who received his PhD in ecology, microbiomics, and public health from the University of Sheffield. His research focuses on the relationship between human health, the ecosystem, and the microbial communities. He uses technology to get and interpret remote data, investigate strategies for ecosystems' health. He is here today to talk about his upcoming book, Invisible Friends. Thank you for coming on the show, Jake. Cheers, John. Thanks very much for inviting me. Of course. To start off, can you tell us a little more about yourself and what is your micro moment? How did you discover the world of microbiology? Yeah, sure. So like you said, I'm in, I'm a microbial ecologist. So I study how microbes interact with each other in their environments. But I also study how they interact with other kingdoms of life as well. So things like animals and plants and how they affect human health. Yeah, so I've always played with micro uh, microscopes as a child. So I've always been a kind of fan of the small underappreciated organisms. Um, and I've really been fascinated by symbiosis as well. So this is the concept that, you know, two or more organisms living in close association with each other. And I studied parasitology for my undergraduate thesis. Um, so it's slightly different than microbiology, but I came, became really interested in how um, certain parasites transmit microbes to different um, different kingdoms of life, essentially. So my thesis was on um, looking at how ticks affect the behavior and uh, ecology of hedgehogs. And then I started learning about how ticks can pick up Bacterium called, uh, well, I forgot the name. Uh, sorry, Borrelia, uh, Borrelia uh, burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, and then things like uh, fleas. They can cause the plague through um, bacterium called Yersinia pestis. And I became really interested in the disease ecology side of things. But then I started exploring um, other kinds of symbiosis. So obviously, parasitism is it's a kind of symbiosis, but it's a parasitic kind where one partner in the um, relationship benefits and the other doesn't benefit at all. In fact, it um, receives harm. Then I started wondering, there must be loads of other kinds of symbiosis out there. How do how do microbes, there are trillions of different species, sure they, they uh, benefit lots of um, organisms in yeah, mutualistic kind of ways. And so this is what kind of led me on to being really fascinated by microbial ecology. And there's the kind of boom in microbiome science at the time as well. And I guess this is, so it's not, it wasn't necessarily a particular moment, a micro moment, it was more of a evolution of moments, I suppose, that led me, but it, it sort of was rooted in this fascination of um, symbioses. I have to say, probably the first example of symbiosis that blew my mind was probably lichen. Yeah, exactly. It's super fascinating. Yeah, two different organisms. You never think about it. No, yeah. What's even more fascinating is, yeah, it's for, for so many years, for decades, it's been seen as this kind of relationship between a fungal partner called the mycobiont and the algae or cyanobacteria partner called the photobiont. But recently, it's been shown that lichen actually have a core microbiome as well. So it's this kind of nested symbiosis. Um, so it's like a symbiotic relationship with a symbiotic relationship within it. So it's super complicated, but really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Microbiology nested doll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a Russian doll <laughs> effect. Of so what's your favorite food that has a micro moment? Um, yeah, I thought about this. So obviously, well, I mean, I absolutely love sauerkraut and tempeh, these sorts of things. But I was thinking, obviously, the answer's got to be chocolate um, or wine. For me, anyway, I'm a, I'm a chocoholic. <laughs> I don't actually eat that much because I try because if I eat so much, if I uh, let my addiction um, get carried away, I'd be huge. But, <laughs> yeah. but I really do love chocolate. Um, yeah. And so I guess the micro moment in chocolate production is the complex flavors consist of hundreds of different compounds. And many are produced by microbes in, during the fermentation process of chocolate. So this is when molecules are broken down and wonderful alchemy takes place and it produces these wonderfully complex flavors in chocolate. So, yeah, definitely chocolate for me. How about you? Oh, um, I'm a big beer person. 
Greek yogurt, nice. I have to say, is probably up there. There's uh, several brands of Greek yogurt that are my favorite. Yeah. Uh, in terms of addiction, I would probably have to say coffee. Okay, yeah. Ob- for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to be totally addicted to coffee. I don't drink it now. It gives me kind of gastrointestinal issues, but obviously messing with my microbiome. But um, yeah, yeah, I love coffee, though. Shame. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think was harder, getting a PhD or writing a book? Yeah, this is a tricky one as well. There are different challenges, obviously different challenges associated with either, but one actually um, led into the other. So it's hard to divide the two because writing my PhD thesis actually and collaborating with different scientists across the globe that kind of came together to help with my research actually very much led into the book writing process. And so it's kind of one big interconnected project. So it was quite challenging overall, but it's kind of hard to say one was harder than the other. Basically, the, the the book is a kind of part memoir of my research experiences during my PhD. Yeah, both do require collaborations, but I'm sure, like at least writing a book, you're reaching out to people that may be further away than in your PhD at times. Yeah, I just I was super enthusiastic during my PhD. I wanted to just work with everybody and learn as much as possible. So, yeah, I highly recommend doing that if you're doing your PhDs, just to collaborate with as many people as you can. In your book, you talk a lot about getting back to nature. How do you see microbes, nature, and humanity coexisting? Yeah, so I like to see this kind of these, this relationship is interconnected and things as a whole. Um, but I think that humans, with perhaps maybe certain cultures, human cultures, I don't like the term westernized or western cultures, but that probably best describes it. We've almost created this illusion that we're separate from the rest of nature. It's like this artificial divide. And I think this is one of the reasons we're seeing things like climate change and mass biodiversity loss, etc. Because we view ourselves as kind of separate or top of this hierarchy in which we assert dominion over nature. But I think it really, if you start to look everywhere, you look at the plants, the animals, um, you can, and again, it's bringing this uh, symbiotic view, this symbiotic perspective. You start to realize that they're not individual entities. In fact, they're communities of life. So what you see in the above ground parts of trees there's just as much complexity going on below ground and, and within the, the trees, tissues, etc. So I think this interconnected relationship is just happening all the time, all around us, and including our own kind of walking ecosystems, our own, our own human bodies as well. Kind of to piggyback off that, yeah. I, I see where you're coming from. And from you know historical perspective, we have had ecological studies, but I guess due to our humanistic tendencies, we tend to remove ourselves from the equation. Yeah, exactly. But we are part of the ecosystem. Exactly. That's how I see it. And um, so, yeah, most of my education has been in ecology. So I kind of view things as everything's ecological, including health as well. I see health as an ecological concept. So, yeah, that's how I see it. I see ourselves as walking, talking ecosystems, essentially. And you can apply principles of ecology across scales, but also to, to our own health as well. And I think Again, I don't, I'm not sure when it happened during our evolution, but at some point, um, particularly Western culture, we kind of see health as this separate um, topic to ecology. When lots of GPs, lots of general practitioners are now starting to see that if you if you apply the principles of ecology to our health context, then you can have lots of successes. It kind of makes sense to me. We're just another species, just another ape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, we're part. You know, we're one species on the earth, and then we have hundreds of thousands of different species on our in us. So how did the whole idea of the book come together? Why were you compelled to write this book and who did you write it for? Yeah, so so I'll answer the last point first. So it's it's for a broad audience. So I've tried to um, kind of hit the middle ground so that scientists and curious-minded non-scientists would enjoy it. And it's quite a broad book, so it covers lots of different topics that affect people's lives in all sorts of different ways. So hopefully I'm trying to reach the, the broadest audience possible. I suppose the inspiration came from wanting to, again, learning about symbioses and mutualistic forms, um, but wanting to take this negative kind of demonizing view of microbes as the bane of society and then flip it on its head. So, you know, sorry to sound morbid now, but far um, far less than 1% of humans die because of microbes. And many of these diseases are actually preventable. So they're often driven by poverty and social inequity, etc. But 100% of humans would be dead without microbes. So they, they contribute to producing the air we breathe, the food we eat, and also the symbiotic relationships within our bodies as well. In fact, we wouldn't even exist without microbes. They're, they're our ancestors and they sort of curated our DNA and our cells, etc. So it's just turning that negative perception of them and trying to stimulate some fascination. But also it goes beyond fascination because they're so important to our lives. 
Yeah, without microbes, plants wouldn't be able to grow, so we wouldn't even have agriculture. And we've evolved to not produce certain vitamins or compounds that the microbes give us. So I found the cover of the art really fun. Who designed it and what was that process like? Um, Yes, that was um, designed by a really talented illustrator and designer in the UK called Laura Bretz. So, yeah, the process was, um, so I sent the publisher a load of examples of different kinds of microbes. And then we kind of bounced back um, back and forth ideas um, for the style and the layout of the cover. And then I guess Laura Betts took over then basically just uh, drew the different microbes in her own style. And we wanted it to be quite simplistic, but also as eye-catching as possible as well. So, yeah, hopefully we've achieved that. <laughs> I mean, it never hurts having a tardigrade on a cover. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You also put an emphasis on defining Latin and Greek words. I was curious as to your thought process doing this, and why was this important to you? Yeah, so this is a, yeah, like you say, it's a personal preference. I'm a bit of an etymology geek, I suppose. I I love how the description of of different organisms or their functional roles can be seen in these scientific names or these Latin and Greek names. So you can sometimes tell quite a lot about what a microbe looks like, or any organism really. What, what it looks like or what it does by analysing the Greek or Latin names. So I think I provided an example in the introduction of Firmophilus aquaticus. Um, so if you break that name down, it's the firmus refers to heat, and then the philus refers to loving or attraction. So it's a heat loving, and then aquaticus refers to its environment that it lives in. So it's a hot spring loving microbe. So you can tell kind of what its functional roles and it's the environment that it comes from just by looking at its name. I thought that was quite, for me, I find that quite interesting anyway. No, I remember when I was in nursing school originally, you know, a lot of medical terms, it follows the same nomenclature. And when you break it down, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, like, exactly. Oh, that makes complete sense now. Yeah. And some of them make no sense whatsoever, which is quite funny to see. <laughs> yeah. Wondering why the heck that was named that, but anyway. Well, you know, so, sometimes people want to name microbes or animals after famous people. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of throws it out the window. Yeah, you don't have to think too seriously about it all the time, I suppose. Just nice when you see right. those examples. Yeah. <laughs> So what is your favorite chapter to write in this book and why? Yeah, this was a tricky question. So I'm not sure I have a favorite chapter. I kind of, the ones where I um, was writing more about the rest of the natural world, that was really good because um, I'd often grab a camping chair and a flask of tea and then head out to the natural world in order to sort of, it's almost like a bit like method acting in a way, kind of like you're surrounded by the environment that you're trying to write about and it provides a lot of inspiration. So sometimes I'd go walking into a woodland or I'd sit on top of a cliff. So people looking, I'd literally be there with a camping chair and a laptop. So people will probably think I'm a total weirdo, but that's okay. Um, so those 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 chapters were the, probably my favorite just because it was a really inspiring environment and you also block out the kind of noisy modern world as well. But I also really like the chapters where I interviewed other people. So people like Professor Graham Rook, Dr. Sue Ishak, Professor John Cryan and uh, Dr. Martin Breed as well. It's just provided, it just added to the fun of the process as well. And it's nice to hear um, different perspectives from the people that actually specialize in these topics. Right. Always hearing different perspectives always gives you new insights and what you're looking at. It does, yeah. I never really thought of that before. Yeah, and it made made the uh, writing process much more enjoyable. And you can also try and coax out some fun anecdotes as well that you you just wouldn't be able to think of if you were just you know doing dry research for like a desktop approach so yeah it's good to interview people so early on in the book you established the connection between multicellular organisms such as plants and animals in the microbial world i was familiar with the hygiene hypothesis which centers around exposing individuals early in life to environment not sterile so that the interactions between the microbes and the people train our immune system to reduce allergies or autoimmune conditions. Yeah. In the book, you talk about the old friend hypothesis. Can you talk a little bit about this and how it relates to the hygiene hypothesis? Yeah, so this is um, it's kind of quite a simple concept, but at the same time, it's quite hard to <laughs> explain. Um, so there's several weird nuances between the two um, hypotheses. So like you say, the hygiene hypothesis was first posited in the late 1980s by someone called Dr. Strachan. I forgot his first name, apologies. But so this basically came about by seeing this rise in allergic conditions such as asthma and hay fever and other conditions in children at the time. And he suggested that we were being too hygienic by using sanitizers and this led to us not being exposed to microbes that caused crowd infections. So these these crowd infections are things like uh, measles, for example. 
and exposure to these crowd infections supposedly trained our immune systems and reduced allergies in the future. But Professor Graham Rook, so he's an immunologist um, from London, and he, he put forward this old friend's hypothesis. And his thinking was that the hygiene hypothesis kind of suggests this idea that we have this evolutionary strategy to crowd infections in, or, you know, in order to adapt and respond to them to build a robust immune system. Um, but these crowd inf infections only began um, very recently in evolutionary terms. So because we never really lived in crowds until in terms of evolution, it's really recent, it's sort of like the last 2,000 years or so. So he's saying that we couldn't possibly have evolved this strategy because um, crowd infections never existed until recently. And actually, he suggests that evidence, evidence suggests that some allergies may be due to the sanitizers themselves. So the sanitizers, the different chemicals, the synthetic chemicals, are actually causing the, the immune system to overreact and inappropriately respond to ordinarily yeah, innocuous substances, things like pollen and dust. And he put forward this old friend's hypothesis to kind of replace this thinking. So he's saying that it's more the removal of biodiversity in general. So, you know, we're cutting down forests, etc. And we're stopping ourselves from spending time in the great outdoors. We're moving into these kind of sterilized houses, sterilized houses that aren't anything like what we've evolved, nothing like the, the ancestral environments that we evolved in. And so it's the removal of biodiversity in general that's uh, leading to inappropriate immune training. And this can be broken down into two forms. So you can look at the adaptive immune system, where we need to be exposed to as many different species as possible from a young age in order to um, produce these tiny armies of immune cells so that when um, microbes, uh, when we're exposed to microbes in the future, we've already got this kind of memory of what they are and how to respond. And then there's the innate immune system. And so this is what's called non-specific immunity. It's our first line of defense. And Graham Rook posits that certain microbes in the environment called old friends and they're called old friends because um, we've co-evolved with them over millions of years, over hundreds of thousands of years. And so these certain microbes actually play an integral role in training the innate immune, innate immune system and regulating it. And because we're removing ourselves from nature, we're also removing ourselves from being exposed to these old friends, these microbes that we've co-evolved with. And so this is the it's a it's a slightly hard one to come to uh, yeah I guess to explain I'm not sure if I'm doing a great job <laughs> hopefully but um but essentially yes yeah, so it's the they're the two differences and he also suggests that or well, he also maintains that ta targeted hygiene is really important so some people take oh no we've been too hygienic too far where it's um, actually really essential to be hygienic to prevent infectious diseases etc you know you've got to keep your toilets clean you've got to keep sinks clean food preparation areas clean that sort of thing but it's this kind of mass sterilization of all services and yeah preventing ourselves from going outside that's the issue kind of along the lines of this there was a commercial in the states that i found hilarious is this woman you know her first child this girl wants to touch her newborn she's like oh and first and she like squirts a uh, purell and in, in the kid's hands and then like the second child's there she's at a mechanics and the guy has oil over his hand she's like uh you hold him while she takes <laughs> like a <laughs> yeah. a phone call yeah yeah exactly yeah, it's interesting. So there's lots of research that kind of supports this old friends hypothesis. And actually, a newer term has been used. It's the biodiversity hypothesis. But it basically means the same thing. But yeah, there's like population level evidence that growing up around biodiverse environments um, is really important for provide training your, your immune system and make sure, making sure it's robust in later life. And especially farming. There's a study in the United States, I think, that compares two very similar um, populations genetically and yeah, ancestrally, etc. And lots of their lifestyle factors are the same. This is the Amish and the uh, Hutterites. But the one thing that really differs is their farming practices. So I think it's the Amish who still pr um, practices quite traditional farming practices. You know, the hands-on with the soil. They they don't use mechanized and chemical-based practices. Whereas the Hutterites have moved to more kind of modern, synthetic, mechanized practices. And we're seeing these two. Uh, significant differences in their uh, immune disorders. The Hutterites have a much higher prevalence of asthma, that kind of stuff. And then they've, they've done experiments by looking at the, the microbes in the house dust of between these two populations. And then, uh, yeah, doing lots of cool experiments to show that it's probably the microbiomes, that's, the differences in the microbiome that's driving these immune disorders based on the fact that one population is less exposed to biodiversity than the other. Hmm. It's really interesting. It's well established that antimicrobial resistance is rising. In your book, you pose that the loss of soil biodiversity could be aiding in this. Why do you think this is, and what other factors have contributed to the rise of antimicrobial resistance? Mm. 
Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So so to answer the latter point first, um, so other factors contributing to antimicrobial resistance are things like unsustainable farming, so kind of mass-produced intensive meat industry. Um, they use antibiotics and hormones. They pump the animals full of these to make sure the animals grow big and fat and healthy, healthy as possible. Um, and so it's this overuse in these kind of industries that's driving it. And um, also things like poor, poor sewage systems that allow raw sewage to just spew out into rivers. So it's actually getting into the natural environment before it's been processed and before these antibiotic resistant genes have been removed. But also inappropriate uses of antibiotics for illnesses is one of the key drives as well. So one funny, well, it's a bit of a, it's kind of annoying really how certain antibiotics are um, prescribed for viruses, for example, when they're only actually any good for bacteria, sorry. So yeah, it's kind of um, inappropriate uses of antibiotics for illnesses. And, not, and um, oh yeah, they're, they're the main kind of drivers anyway. So what was the original question? It was how does um, loss of soil biodiversity aid this process? Yeah, so this is really early research, so we're not quite sure yet, but there's been a couple of studies that suggest that reduced soil biodiversity does contribute to this as- exacerbation of antimicrobial resistance genes in the environment. Um, so some factors could be that competition for nutrients um, may limit opportunistic species with these kind of genes in highly diverse communities. So where there's lots of different species, they may be more likely to outcompete these opportunistic species. That could be one thing that's contributing to it. Certain bacteria, if you've got a diversity of bacteria, then you've also got a diversity of metabolites, so things like antibiotics that the bacteria produce themselves. So this could play a role in controlling opportunistic species as well. Yeah, the functional overlap, I suppose, is when the microbial community is more diverse, the functional overlap is greater. So when if you decrease the diversity of soil microorganisms, the degree of functional overlap decreases and allows opportunists to find, conquer, and become established in a niche that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. So it's this kind of competition effect, possibly. I mean, this is only speculation. It's just kind of based on principles of ecology, I suppose. But yeah, we definitely need more research to to find out this out for sure. I'm not sure if this allegory would work exactly, but I, I feel like on the macro scale, it's kind of like in terms of farming, you can grow different types of fruits and vegetables and one can act as a barrier to prevent a disease from popping up on another plant. But if you just do one crop, then that has a greater chance of getting an infection and infection spreads throughout the crop. Yeah, exactly. It's a similar principle. Yeah. There's also the di- uh, the dilution effect, I think it's called, but I'm not, it's a, kind of a bit of a contested one. It's like basically like what you say, the more species, the less likely that an opportunist can proliferate. But it's still early days in terms of the science. Right. So I found that this book gave me a little bit of an existential crisis, as in a couple of chapters, you bring up evidence that microbes can affect and influence our behavior. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, how much of my decisions are actually my mm-hmm. decisions? Yeah. And it goes down a whole rabbit hole. But what do you think your microbes have impacted your life? And how do you think urban lifestyles are impacting our microbial controlled behaviors? Yeah, that's right. So this was a really um, fun part of the book to write, actually. So yeah, there's strong evidence now for this microbiota gut-brain axis. So this is this kind of two-way communication system. It's like highway between our gastrointestinal tract and our brains and our central nervous systems. And it's thought that microbes can influence this uh, communication pathway in all sorts of different ways and then have this influence on our mental health and our behavior, etc. And it's been demonstrated in animal models, like lots of different animal models now, that symbiotic microbes can influence things like sexual preference, feeding decisions, the environments that animals spend time in, this kind of stuff. So, yeah, it definitely puts the concept of free will into question. <laughs> like you said, <laughs> yeah, I apologize for your mini existential crisis. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so I'm not sure how microbes have influenced my decisions at all, but I'm just from the, the evidence that's around it, there are studies to show that microbes living inside our guts can influence our our decisions in all sorts of weird ways but um one really important factor to think about is how they influence our mental health and so professor john crine who i interviewed for the book he's developing this concept called um, psychobiotics so it's like what we eat can influence um, the condition of our microbial gut ecosystem which then can influence um, our mental health and our central nervous system so it's trying to identify what's the best things that we can put inside our bodies to look after our microbes that they can look after us yeah, and urbanization. So urbanization and associated lifestyles 
are known to be reducing the diversity of species in the human microbiome. This is probably due to things like ultra-processed diets, uh, reduced exposure to biodiverse environments, so the things we were talking about earlier, and also pollution, etc. These things can interact with the microbes on, in and on our bodies. And by changing our microbiomes, for example, it may be contributing to a rise in mental health conditions, um, which could obviously uh, alter our behaviour in all sorts of different kind of ways. Again, it's early days in understanding the precise impacts of urbanisation and the precise mechanisms, etc. But yeah, it's really fascinating, important research, I think. Yeah, definitely. I know there hasn't been a clear connection yet. Take Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, yeah. Generally, people develop GI symptoms years before Parkinson's symptoms uh, arise. So now the thought is, is it possible that our microbiome may be influencing the cause of this disease? We're not 100% sure yeah. because, you know, is it just a correlation, not a causation that exactly, we're seeing? Yeah. But still, you know, it shows the possibility of that at least. Yeah, exactly. I mean, something like 90 or 95% of diseases it can be linked back to the microbiome now. Like, like you say, we're not sure of the directionality of the relationship in all these cases. Yeah, it's certainly important to study. Yeah, just thinking about, like I said earlier, thinking about the concept of health as ecological. It kind of makes sense. That if we look after our internal gut ecosystem through, you know, principles of ecology, et cetera, that then this is going to have a beneficial effect on our overall body and our overall ecosystem. So obviously that's an anecdotal perspective, but it's kind of like it makes sense in my mind, which is one reason this additional research is really important. Exactly. I'd like to pivot a little bit to agriculture as it's a big part of your book. Yeah. You spend quite a bit of time on organic farming and how it revitalizes soil biodiversity. But do you think organic is the answer given our current societal and population size? If so, do you think we as a society could get there? If not, are there other solutions? And how might microbes be involved in these? I know that was a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good questions. Yeah, so it's difficult to give a kind of pithy answer to this, as there are obviously lots of um, social, political, environmental factors that to consider. But I personally think we should be practicing more and more regenerative um, agricultural practices and reducing intensive farming and monoculture crops. So we've, we've we've kind of touched on some of the negative impacts of these, not only just on clearing biodiversity, but you know things like we spoke about earlier: antibiotic, uh, microbial resistance. What else do we talk about? Yeah, uh, the chances of disease spreading due to monocultures, this kind of stuff. So I think we really should be thinking more about regenerative agricultural approaches. There's this interesting example called syntropic agroforestry, which I um, recommend yeah, listeners to go and do a bit of research on this. It's super interesting. And there's actually a syntropic agroforestry farm in New Zealand called Permadynamics. So yeah, dig into those and you'll find a lot more information out about it. But they basically use ecological principles to grow diverse crops alongside and within forest ecosystems. So it kind of uses principles such as natural succession, these sorts of things, and it can actually increase the total yield of food whilst restoring nature itself. And so overall, you can actually get a, a bigger yield of the food product, but you're also looking after biodiversity as well. So people would say, like, organic, not going to get as much food for the land, etc. But I beg to differ. Syntropic agroforestry seems like a good example of what, how this is possible. Yeah, and so in, in terms of... Other technological ideas. Um, so in the book, I mentioned things like precision fermentation. So there's this one example where a couple of companies now are replacing or trying to replace cow's milk with and other dairy products with microbes that can actually produce the same proteins in the milk. And so this is thought to significantly reduce the CO2 footprint and the land usage and water uses, etc. So this is quite interesting, but it's obviously slightly controversial because it has it takes this genetically modified approach, which can be controversial i suppose i'm not sure where i sit with this yet i'd rather take a more naturalistic kind of ecosystems approach but it's certainly interesting um, and if, if it does lead to re reductions in our co2 footprint and our you know, habitat clearance that kind of stuff then it's worth considering i think what do you think <laughs> it's tough um yeah, it's it, it because you know our population is growing mm. i think well, partially, I feel like if we can get a handle on growing in urban environments, that'd be a benefit. Yeah, it's whole vertical farming, isn't it? That's quite interesting. Yeah. And, you know, hydroponics has been around for a while. One thing that my wife and I were talking about, and she brought up a good, good point, is there is a, a lack of, 
using microbes in hydroponics, right? It's usually water and nutrients, but, you know, these plants need microbes for certain aspects. And yeah. it is a little, it may be a little bit limiting due to the lack of use of, like I said, uh, soil microbes a little bit. And um, I, maybe upscale is a little, a little bit of an issue that we've yet to really pinpoint when it comes to techniques like that, you know, getting on a sure. larger scale. It's usually a lot smaller. A, a lot of things you see is are for probably like, you know, growing plants in your house, not yeah, sure. usually like warehouse type things. But if we can get a handle on that, I think that... Yeah, I think so. I think like diversifying approaches is important. Like you say, the population is growing, so we need to be realistic as well. But I think these kind of big uh, agri organizations, much like the big farmer, they have such an influence on our perspective as well and like controlling the industry that it's kind of hard but it's hard for us to see there's that there's a different option but there are different options and yeah like you say i think it's just the taking a diversity approach diversity of approaches is important that that's what i would say probably to summarize you know we need a multifaceted approach mm. on agriculture to solve the problem i don't think it's going to be specifically one i think we're gonna have to yeah i think so utilize our resources as best we can yeah i'd agree with that so can we expect any more books from you in the future? Are there any ideas yet? Yes, yeah, so I've actually nearly finished my second book now. I'm not sure what it's called right now because the this goes, sort of ideas for the book titles goes to and fro between myself and the publisher. But anyway, it's about it's sort of about restoring global forest ecosystems. So it's about the science, the, the controversies, uh, but also stories of success and hope as well. So that will be probably be published in 2024, I think. There will also be certain microbial ecology aspects involved as well. Too. Yeah, it's all about restoring forests. Hmm. Is there anyone you would like to thank? I'd like to thank all the scientists. Sounds like an Oscar speech now. I'd like to thank all the <laughs> scientists who con contributed to the book. So I mentioned earlier people like Professor Graham Rook, Dr. Sue Ishak, Dr. Martin Breed. Yeah, and who else? There's a few others as well. Yeah, anyway, you know who you are, everybody who contributed to the book. Yeah, I'd like to thank those. Um, I'm a publisher as well. And my wife and my dog. I have got a dog. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find or buy your book so yeah you can find me on uh, www.jakemrobinson.com or on twitter at underscore jake underscore robinson and you can buy the book on um, various places places like amazon bookshop.org it'll also be in book bookstores themselves and in the near future as well is there anything else you'd like to share before we go if you buy the book it'd be great if you could leave a review on amazon or goodreads etc that'd be really helpful all right. So everyone keep an eye out for Invisible Friends that is coming out later this month. Thank you again. Yes, John. Well, Microbial Nation, that is our episode. I'd like to thank Jake again for coming on. And if you are interested in his book, keep an eye out for Invisible Friends. But if you're interested in free stuff, why don't you follow us on Instagram as we will be giving away a copy of his upcoming book. Keep an eye out as we will be releasing details on this giveaway soon. Until next time, everybody, feed your microbes, feed your guts. Make your microbes love you lots. Bye.